Okay, so last time uh, we talked about some of the more theory aspects of, of budgets. And so today what we're going to get into is, you know, budgets, uh, you know, part two. And the idea is that we're going to get into sort of like the brass tax uh, stuff. You know, we're going to try to ask the question, uh, or try to answer the question, you know, how do uh, economists uh, and politicians uh, think about debt deficits uh, and the budget okay and so uh, and in this we'll also include you know some aspects of like the media uh, as well right so <clears throat> oops wrong button here we go okay so let's start with a really easy one let's start off with here how do we actually measure uh, the deficit <clears throat> let's say deficits or surpluses okay so typically uh, what we'll do is we'll measure them as a percent GDP so we'll measure you know uh, deficit for example uh, as a, a percent of that country's GDP okay now why do we do that right why do it this way Right? Why don't we just look at like dollar amounts? Right? Why do we do things in a convoluted way rather than a simple, straightforward way? Is it the case that we're trying to perhaps obfuscate uh, things or try to make things more difficult? Well, not really. Okay, so we record debts as a percent of GDP, right? <clears throat> because you know, being let's say uh, one trillion dollars in debt for how about for example the US uh, is very different uh, than being a trillion dollars in debt if you're Haiti right so we want to have some sort of a uh, measure that records debts and surpluses for that matter even if you have you know different sized economies so that we can kind of get a sense of you know how big is the debt really right compared to how much income or production is actually happening uh, today the last I, I saw uh, the US debt to GDP ratio was about a hundred and four percent the last time it was that high was in 1946 uh, which was you know right after World War two uh, note that this is this is total right and really I think this is this number comes from I think 2000 and 18 right so uh, this is probably a lot higher today uh, than it was in 2018 so we're at a pretty high level of, of debt in this country now that's not to say it's a good thing or a bad thing this is just a fact we have a lot of debt okay now this this number again this 104 percent here this is the total amount of debt accrued over all years it's not you know how much debt we incurred you know this year uh, to look at some of this stuff, we can look to uh, what's called FRED data, which comes from the St. Louis Federal Reserve. Okay, so here uh, we have a graph of gross federal debt as a percent of GDP for the U.S. All right, so I just started off in 1948 uh, when it was 91 percent. You can kind of see uh, over toward the right-hand side, basically after about 1981, the, the relationship is basically positive right there were some some decreases in maybe 96 uh, with Clinton's second term but basically since basically since about 1981 uh, the debt to GDP ratio has been increasing over time uh, the shaded regions just in case you've never uh, seen any Fred data the shaded regions mark uh, economic recessions okay so uh, <coughs> excuse me we can also look at um, Instead of looking at this, we can look at federal surpluses or deficits uh, as a percent of GDP. So these are annual figures. Uh, let's see, we can see in uh, 1940, right, the, uh, there was a percent, a, uh, up to a, a basically a 27% uh, deficit uh, 
as a percent GDP. Uh, that makes sense. We were in, you know, a war that year. Um, and you can kind of see this, this black line that goes across kind of the top. That's zero. Okay, so if you run, uh, if you have no debt as a percent GDP, <coughs> then you would be on that line. Anytime you're below the line means you are incurring debt. Anytime you're above it means you are uh, running a surplus. So you can kind of see, for the most part, we've always been below, right? There's a few instances where we're above, uh, but we're, by and large, we're almost always uh, below, <clears throat> okay? And so uh, the question we might, you know, kind of ponder is how can we sort of think about this or what's what might be causing this? And one way to look at this is to look at borrowing uh, from the perspective of the federal or the federal government and savings, I'm sorry, and taxation, right? Well, if you think about it from a government perspective, these must be kind of like substitutes, right? If you want, if you are the federal government and you want to spend more money, right? Well, you have kind of two ways. You can tax the people more money right, and increase your tax revenue and then spend that money. Alternatively, you could borrow the money, okay? And these are two alternative ways to increase the number of dollars that we as a federal government have at our disposal, okay? So they are uh, alternatives of increasing the number of dollars the government has uh, to spend. Okay, though we should note uh, that increasing taxes isn't as straightforward as we've perhaps made it seem in some algebraic expressions. There's this pesky little thing uh, called uh, the Laffer curve. Okay. And so uh, the Laffer, <coughs> Arthur Laffer, the guy who came up with it, hence the name, right? Remember, in economics, we name everything, you know, really boring. It's either named after exactly what it is or after the guy who uh, figured it out. And this was discovered or, or first postulated, I guess, by a guy named Art Laffer. And so uh, he applied it to income taxes specifically. Uh, but the basic idea applies to, you know, all taxes uh, for the most part. Okay, and so let's kind of go through how we could construct this. Okay, so uh, we're gonna do our, our graph. Okay, so on the uh, y-axis, we're gonna have uh, tax revenue. And on the x-axis, we're gonna have like the tax uh, rate. Okay, and we could have, you know, a 0% tax. And we could have like a 100% tax. Okay. And you can have anything, you know, in between. You could have anything above it if you want to. Uh, there's no reason to have, you know, to exclude anything over here. Uh, but we don't need to really think about that. Okay, so intuitively, if we had a 0% tax rate, right, well then tax revenue would also be 0%, right? So we'd have no tax revenue. And what Arthur Laffer kind of came up with or, or argued is that if you had a 100% tax rate, now keep in mind, this is uh, not marginal, okay? So this is not a marginal tax, though you could apply it to marginal taxes as well. Uh, if you had a 100% tax rate, the question then becomes like, how much tax revenue would you raise? Now in you know a typical like linear fashion, you'd say like, oh, well here, it should look kind of like that. Right? And it should like tend toward infinity, right? As we tax more people, they're gonna, you know, give us more money, right? But really, think about this. How many of you uh, would go to work if we taxed 100% of your paycheck, right? So you go to work, you work your 40 hours, right? And you get your paycheck and it's for zero dollars, right? Your pay, right, was your pre-tax pay would be some positive amount, but your tax bill would be exactly how much money you made. The question then becomes like, would you go to work? And Arthur Laffer kind of realized, or reasoned that most people, if you taxed 100% of their income or 100% of any activity away, 
well, then they would do none of it. But if you have no uh, tax base that you're going to tax, so if people aren't, for in the income sense, if people aren't going to work, then they have an income of zero. And you can tax that at 100%, but a 100% tax times zero dollars of income is going to be equal to zero dollars of tax revenue. So he reasoned that this point here uh, would also be accurate, that at a 100% tax rate, you would have no tax revenue. And so here's kind of the question. If you started at 0% and increased taxes to say 1%, well, clearly you're going to have some amount of tax revenue, right? And he kind of said like, okay, well, we know that, right? And if we go from here, then the relationship must look something like this. Okay, now I've drawn uh, this picture such that it looks like somewhere around 50% is optimal. That's not necessarily the case, right? Not necessarily the case. Okay, the optimal, ta or the, the highest amount of tax revenue, like it could look, you know, like this, right? It could maybe uh, even look um, something like this. Right? It could be any shape there. Okay, so I'm drawing it in, in different ways here to try to show you that you know we don't know exactly where, uh, or Art didn't know exactly where this sort of peak point was. Okay, but he reasoned that there was some point uh, that must have been like optimal. Right. So in this case, in the in the red case, right, we maximize tax revenue at this tax rate here. Right. In the blue case, it's here. Right. And in the white case, it's here. Okay. And so the question was, how do you figure out what that optimal tax rate is such that you maximize tax revenue? Okay. Now this becomes uh, sort of the basis of a lot of arguments uh, in economics and in policy. Okay. So I'm going to draw it again as if 50% was optimal, right? Just because it's easy to draw, you know, a, a normal distribution curve okay and so here's kind of the uh, the idea where if you find yourself if let's say the optimal rate was 50% right we're gonna pretend I'm just gonna say it's that okay well if you were at a tax rate of 75% well then the optimal strategy would be to lower taxes right and if instead you were at you know maybe um, a tax rate of of 25%, well then the optimal strategy would be to increase taxes, right? To increase taxes on people so that you raise more tax revenue, okay? Now this becomes uh, the basis of lots of fighting. Now you can probably guess uh, which political party thinks we're on which side of each curve, right? For the most part, uh, the Republican Party uh, argues that we're over here right on the right hand side of this optimal thing. So if we lowered taxes, we would increase tax revenue, right? And for the most part uh, in the US, the Democrat, the Democratic Party uh, assumes that we're over on the right hand, I'm sorry, on the left hand side where we need to raise taxes. Now again, these are broad generalizations. Okay, so don't walk out of uh, this and say, you know, Dave Hebert says blah, 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 right? This is a generalization. It's not true for every Republican. It's not true for every Democrat. Okay, but in general, this seems to be the case. This is why uh, Republicans typically argue that their tax cuts will pay for themselves, right? Because in theory, right, even though you are taxing people fewer dollars, they're going to increase their activity, right? And then they will actually end up paying more in taxes, right? So the idea is that by lowering uh, taxes on, for example, uh, income, people work more, <clears throat> right? Uh, they earn more and pay more uh, in taxes, okay? We can do this uh, in <clears throat> standard, you know, tax efficiency or in our uh, tax, you know, uh, supply and demand curves, right? So let's say we had uh, a tax 
rate of whatever this would be, right? And then we have sort of here, right? <clears throat> we can see that if I, you know, lowered the tax rate, right? So this is some tax rate uh, here. So we have our P plus and our P minus, right? Demand and supply, I should label all my axes, right? Shame on me for uh, not doing that. Okay, so if we lowered our taxes, right, well then what would happen is this rectangle here, this tax revenue rectangle, would get uh, narrower, right, which is true, okay, but notice that it would also get deeper. And so the comparison is going to be between this red shape here that I shaded in, that red box, versus those blue boxes, right? Uh, if the red area is larger than the blue area, then tax revenue increases, right? And if it's, uh, if it's smaller than the blue area, so in this example, it's, it seems to be smaller, it looks like it's gonna be smaller, then here tax revenue would actually decrease okay <clears throat> and so this is kind of like the idea behind sort of the optimal tax uh, literature right and there's a great exercise you can go through uh, if you want to do the calculus behind it right it's a really fun exercise to figure out like how do you maximize uh, tax revenue right the wonderful calculus problem it's a ton of fun to solve and it has a really easy and elegant solution once you kind of work through it all okay uh, but I'm not going to show it to you here calculus is not a prerequisite for this class so we're you know I'll save that maybe I'll make a, a appendix video to this one and kind of go through it okay so that's a brief sort of idea behind uh, taxation and you know one form of raising revenue can you raise taxes indefinitely and increase tax revenue the answer is no like anyone who says yes is clearly wrong okay uh, but you know depending on where you are on that Laffer curve you might be able to do it okay <clears throat> now uh, when it comes to borrowing right <clears throat> we might ask the question you know why bother Uh, borrowing right well it turns out it's advantageous okay <clears throat> and so here's kind of the thing borrowing from the perspective of a politician right so we're doing this from the point of view of a politician borrowing has certain advantages right so if you finance the operation of government through borrowing do you have to raise taxes today, right? Well, no. So there'd be no need uh, to raise taxes today uh, if you borrow, okay? You simply <coughs> uh, leave the tax rate alone, issue some government debt, some people buy it, some people don't, right? And then, you know, you go on your merry way. Now, the question is like, will the you know bill right and here i mean like the bill not like a, a bill in congress will the bill eventually come due yes right that is going to happen but here's kind of the snarky or like pithy answer right uh, but that is you know the next congress's problem Right. So, <clears throat> you know, here's kind of the the rub of it is, yeah, the bill will come due eventually. Like, there's no quibbling about that. Right. But if you are in office today and you don't plan on seeking reelection or perhaps you're term limited or perhaps, you know, any particular reason why, you know, you won't be in office in the future. Well, guess what? You might as well just like finance the operation of government through borrowing because you're not going to be the one that has to raise taxes to pay off that debt, okay? And so borrowing does have uh, some advantages, right? Now, 
uh, what determines, you know, swings? So like what uh, determines uh, swings in uh, deficits and surpluses? Yeah, whoops, spelled that wrong. Deficits and surpluses. Okay, <clears throat> well, for starters, one thing would be uh, the business cycle. Okay, so for example, like during a recession, uh, like we're experiencing with this COVID uh, thing going on, you know, what do you think is going to happen to deficits? Well, on the one hand, right, we should see a uh, increase in expenditures. Right, and this is all from the federal government's perspective. Uh, as more people qualify for, you know, e.g., uh, welfare programs. Okay, <clears throat> we should also see a decrease uh, in revenue um, as well. Because we should expect that people, you know, aren't some people aren't going to be working, you know, not working, right? No income means no tax revenue uh, from income, right? They'll still pay, you know, sales taxes and other taxes like that, okay? And so if we're going to have, you know, expenditures uh, increasing and revenues, you know, decreasing, then uh, government deficit, the deficit, uh, should increase, okay? And so that's just simple arithmetic or simple accounting, right? If you... Uh, have greater expenditures and less revenues, then you're going to be in a greater deficit. Okay, uh, nothing too controversial there. Uh, likewise, you know we could say that uh, you know budget deficits uh, tend to decrease during like boom periods. For example, the 1990s. So like, why was Bill Clinton's budget balanced? Right, a part of it was what we call the tech boom in the 90s. Right, so the federal government was just a wash in increased revenues. Another, so we had uh, rather than having revenues decreasing, we had revenues actually increasing. Okay, <clears throat> and then the other reason is that during the Clinton years, uh, the Republican, who was a Democrat, uh, the Republican Party controlled uh, either the entire Congress uh, or at least one chamber of Congress. Right. And so relatively few uh, spending bills were actually passed. And so expenditures uh, were lower as well. Well, if you have something like that, well, then the deficit is going to go down. Right. And so the business cycle uh, is a big, you know, propon or a big component of uh, massive swings and deficits and surpluses. Okay. Now, uh, the effect of this. So. Perhaps we could think about uh, political equilibrium. All right, so several weeks ago, or I guess months ago now, uh, we viewed sort of each decision uh, sort of in isolation. Okay, as if we were deciding for programs that affected, you know, maybe just the current population only. But here's the thing, we kind of, if you think about it a little bit, we know that, you know, what we do today affects the future, right? If you disagree with me, then climate change is clearly not a problem, right? Because if what we do today doesn't matter for the future, then screw it. Let's burn all the oil today. Why bother, right? So we know that what we do today affects the future, okay? You know, and typically we talk about costs. Right? So, for example, pollution, right? Natural resource depletion, 
right? Uh, species going extinct, you know, etc. Okay, uh, but we also can think about uh, other things. So what we do uh, today also benefits the future. For example, if we reduce pollution, right? Reducing pollution clearly would benefit future generations. Conserving fossil fuels right? Military advances Right? The list goes on and on and on, right? Things that we do today, these are would all be like benefits. Well, this, this one maybe not, but uh, these are all sort of like benefits that we leave behind. Okay? And so <clears throat> in these types of situations, deficit spending uh, might make sense right why well because if future generations are going to enjoy the benefits of these advancements then they should in principle at least be willing to pay for it at some level right we can think about uh, Lindahl pricing again right except instead of thinking about three people or whatever instead of thinking about people at the same time, let's think about people at different times. Right? It's the same logic, right? <clears throat> now, the real world problem, so what is sort of the real world problem with this? Right? <clears throat> well, here's kind of the question. You know, today I can go ask, you know, Marty or Charles from our security guard example, you know, hey, how much would you be willing to pay for security guards, right? And through some clever demand revelation mechanisms, right? Demand revelation mechanisms, uh, work if the person exists or is old enough. right <clears throat> but what about people who don't exist right what about who haven't been born right or uh, what about my uh, at the time of this recording my seven month old son uh, Wesley Right? Can I go up and ask Wesley what his uh, what his demand for military spending would be, or what his demand for the reduction in pollution would be? Of course not. Right? We cannot know. Right? And so <clears throat> you can estimate it. Right? But this seems kind of weird, and it seems like you'd have to make a lot of assumptions, and those assumptions would ultimately be driving your results. <clears throat> okay, now this has some other effects. So, borrowing uh, other effects. Okay, <clears throat> now this was first argued uh, by a guy named David Ricardo. Uh, way back in about 1800, uh, around then. Uh, and this idea is now known uh, easily as Ricardian equivalence. See what I mean about naming things? Here you go, right, right there. Okay, So, <clears throat> you know, we name things after people, and there you are. Now, Ricardo, you know, so I should point out, like, at the time, Economists basically said that things like uh, interest rates, uh, let's see, consumption, 
and economic growth <clears throat> would all be you know completely unaffected uh, by you know government borrowing okay <clears throat> now Ricardo thought differently now, <clears throat> Ricardo uh, disagreed with this. And his basic insight, at least here, because uh, he had tons and tons of insights across lots of areas, uh, was to say, you know, hey, wait a minute. Someone's going to have to pay back those loans, and that someone is going to be the taxpayer, right? So taxpayers will have uh, to pay those loans you know at some point okay and so <clears throat> shouldn't rational people so I gotta right so shouldn't rational people you know when they see uh, government debt increase shouldn't rational people uh, start saving money you know more money for the future tax increase okay and the rest of the economics community or really the political philosophy community because there wasn't really an economics at the time uh, kinda just laughed at him right they said hey you know Dave go pound sand you're full of a bunch of nonsense, right? Some economists uh, today, and so some economists uh, such as Robert Barrow believe uh, in this idea of what we call crowding out, right? So Barrow uh, calls this crowding out. Oops, that was a brutal U. Crowding out theory, okay? And the idea is that government borrowing money, so government borrowing, Uh, basically reduces private borrowing right <clears throat> now empirically or so in other words people will save money or reduce their consumption by an equal amount uh, to the amount that's actually being borrowed now empirically so empirically There's good evidence for this. Okay, now some economists believe that government uh, borrowing crowds out an amount of private savings or spending equal to the amount borrowed. Uh, myself, I'm not totally convinced that it's equal, uh, but I think that there's some amount that's definitely going to happen. Now let's kind of see, you know, how we can, you know, think about this. So. Let's go back, whoops, let's go back to our, our market for loanable funds from uh, a macroeconomics course or a money and banking course. You have the interest rate, I, on the y-axis, and then you have sort of like the quantity of what we could call loanable funds on the x-axis, okay? And so, you know, we have our familiar demand curve, right? We have our familiar supply curve, and it's always useful to point out, you know, who is who in this uh, framework. So in this case, demand would be the borrowers, and supply would be the savers or lenders. Okay. Now, if that's the case, and we have this entity called government that is now going to start borrowing. Okay. So we can see our our equilibrium, you know, uh, quantity to star, and our equilibrium, you know, interest rate. I star and we're pretending there's only one interest rate which is not true but you know we're, we're gonna make some assumptions here okay and so if we have this this new entity called government that's going to start borrowing well that would be a shift in the demand curve right and we've we have another borrower it's gonna shift it to the right and if it's government it's not like they're gonna borrow money to like build a house they're gonna borrow money to like buy an airplane or whatever right and so there should be a pretty big increase in 
uh, what we call the demand for loanable funds. Now this is going to be the demand curve uh, for private borrowing. So private uh, plus the change in government borrowing. Okay, And so notice what happens to the interest rate here. Right? The interest rate is going to uh, increase, we'll call this I2. Uh, the amount of loanable funds will increase as well to some new you know, Q2. But here's kind of the, the tricky insight. If we want to see, so let's pretend that, uh, let's pretend this is just this D, whoops, this demand, this first demand curve here. Let's pretend that that's just borrower or private borrowing. And then this other one here, this is private borrowing plus government borrowing. Let's just pretend that for a minute. Okay. If we wanted to see what private borrowers would do at this new interest rate, we can actually see at the old or on the old demand curve what they would do at this new interest rate here. And we can see that their amount of borrowing or investment or whatever you want to call it is going to decrease, right? And that makes sense. At higher interest rates, people borrow less money. Think about your student loan payments or your car payments if you have any, or whatever other interest rate payments you guys are paying. Right? If that interest rate were higher at the time you signed that bill or that contract, you might not have signed it. Right? <clears throat> and so at higher interest rates, people borrow, private people will borrow less money. And this is the idea of crowding out. Right? So the amount of money that we used to borrow was right here, but then we borrow less money as a result of government action here, and then this amount from here to here is the amount borrowed, in this case, by government. Okay, So when government borrows money, they crowd out some private investment, hence the name crowding out. Okay. Now, uh, let's see if you guys can think about, so how do we apply Ricardo's insight, okay? <clears throat> and so the idea here is to say that if Ricardo is exactly right, we're gonna have some quantity of loanable funds, and we're gonna have some interest rate here, and we'll have our demand curve, and we'll have our supply curve, okay? Now, the idea if Ricardo is exactly right, so here's our you know equilibrium, and here is our equilibrium interest rate. We'll just call them I1 and Q1. Okay, and so then you know we have our uh, increased borrowing from government. Call it D2. <clears throat> if Ricardo's right, and people start to save more money, well then that's going to be a shift in the supply of loanable funds because now we have people saving more money. And if he's exactly right, if we were to work this out correctly, what you would see is that the supply of loanable funds would shift out enough to keep the, in oops, hit the wrong one, there we go, would shift out enough to keep the interest rate uh, the same, right? So yes, there would be uh, an increase in the quantity of funds loaned, right? but the interest rate uh, would stay the same, right? <clears throat> and so that would be uh, what would need to happen if Ricardo was exactly right. Now, do I think that this uh, supply shift, you know, is exactly equal? I don't know, right? I'm, I'm not unconvinced, I'm not convinced. It could be, and it also could not be, okay? It's a difficult question to suss out uh, because you're gonna have lots of periods, you know, lots of, of periods to look at, Right, so different times, right? And time is just tricky uh, to work with. Right? Uh, it seems to me that given that uh, that we are running a deficit and we have a ton of debt in this country, it would seem to me that this this shift here is not enough. Uh, but you know, only time will tell, right? The the strict Ricardians could always say. Uh, that we haven't quite gotten to the long, it's not a long enough run yet, right? And, you know, there's some truth to that, right? If, if Ricardian equivalents were not true, then that would argue that government could create resources out of thin air, and that seems a bit, uh, 
a bit non-true, uh, but I don't know. It's a tough question. So this is uh, a big area in public finance uh, literature right now. Right. So if you want to, you know, find something cool to research, you know, this is it. Like the question of does supply, does the supply of loanable funds, does it shift out enough to cover the increased borrowing? Huge question, very important question, um, <coughs> and one that, that we're not quite sure on just yet.